And it was all fun and games until they realized that that habit was sacrificing the future that they so were compelled by, that they so badly wanted to create. And this little, let me prevent you from holding me accountable. I never want to be held accountable. That proactive defense of keeping things vague and ambiguous and hard to pin down was sacrificing the very future that they had hired us to support them in accomplishing. Welcome to season two of Leadership Impact, the podcast for modern executives who are reinventing leadership within their organizations. With your host, executive leadership coach and CEO of the Granger Network, Kerry Granger, and me, Paul Adams, CEO of Sound Financial Group. This season focuses on accountability, and to support you in increasing accountability in yourself and in those you lead, we're providing a special rate for our listeners who want to engage in one of our accountability courses. Text the word accountability to 555-888 for more information. This is episode 27, Stop Holding People Accountable. I'm so glad you could join us on this episode. Now you'll notice there's a fair amount of background noise for Carrie, and that's echo in the room because we switched to a new mic. We've now fixed all those audio problems, but Carrie was so good in this one, we didn't want you to miss out on the content. We hope you enjoy it. Welcome back to Leadership Impact. Pa, stop holding people accountable. I got to tell you, when you told me this was going to be episode title, I was like, hallelujah, at least somebody finally said it. My job as a leader is going to be so much easier because <laughs> how much time is used by everybody holding people accountable. I don't even care what we do instead. I'm just glad we're going to stop doing <laughs> holding people accountable. No, it's like, you know, you know, the saying, like, uh, walk through the door that's open. Uh huh. This is a lure to get people onto this episode. <laughs> and for everybody else in the country that doesn't speak exactly like Carrie, she's talking about a lure. Oh. Like fishing. <laughs> but I like the way Carrie says it. So I'm not going to bust her chops about it. But just to translate for the rest of people who talk a little <laughs> redneck like me, it's a lure. It's got like two extra syllables you wouldn't expect. That's okay. I live in the mountains and there's no T in that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So why even say stop holding people accountable? You know, if you've been listening to this season on accountability, pretty soon, Holding people accountable starts to sound kind of antithetical to this new model, mm -hmm. right? So even in the last episode, we talked about how when you maintain all the accountability, it robs the other of having their own accountability, right? Yes. And just the phrase, I need to hold you accountable, already creates that you lack something that I have. Mm. There's a lack over there, or you have to be managed, or, you know, it just takes all the capability and ownership and responsibility away from you. Yes. One of the places that I do a lot of work in, and I think, you know, I've said this before, if you've been with us for a while, but is the military. And one of the things in the military is enforcing standards. Now, the military isn't the only place we need to, quote, enforce standards, but one of my clients, I'm about ready to do an alignment session with them, like kind of a strategy session and a strategic alignment. And whenever I do that, I always do interviews first. I interview not just that the people in the room I'm going to be working with, but I interview their people, you know, like a demographic. And one of the things in this military unit that kept coming up as, you know, what impedes our success is that we don't enforce standards enough. Enforcing standards came up probably, I don't know, out of the 40 interviews, it probably came up 30 times. We need to enforce standards. Wow. And boy, it, it, they mean it when it's a military organization saying we want to enforce standards. And they're people that already know how to do it. It's kind of amazing to me that they would word it that way. 
This is a place in which there's um, a good number of people who are being trained and a good number of trainers, you know, in a military context. And mostly what they're talking about when they're talking about enforcing standards is just uniform standards, wearing your uniform correctly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what is this setting up? Is it setting up this dynamic? It's again, setting up this really parental dynamic, right? Yes. And I thought, well, Rather than an enforcing standard is very much like I'm going to hold you accountable, right? In that paradigm. Yeah. And sure, at some point you do need to enforce there are consequences to not meeting standards. And from that standpoint, you know, that makes sense. Here's, here's what you committed to doing and here's the consequence. I'm not saying don't do that. But to have the headline be we need to enforce standards is very different than, think about this, we need to inspire standards, mm. right? We need to actually enroll people in meeting standards, right? We need to engage a level of commitment around meeting standards. So it was just amazing to me that the first place they went was we need to enforce what people are doing wrong versus, whoa, Maybe this is more my capacity as a leader to inspire standards, to have people see, ah, I want to be someone who meets standards. I want to be someone who shows up with the right uniform. When you've talked before about kind of having moral responses to things versus sticking with workability mm. and just even the way that you recontextualized the observance of the problem mm -hmm. instead of enforce standards, we do inspire people to follow the standards. Like right there, just in the rewording of the issue, it creates this new dynamic that actually feels much more workable. It's going to feel different even to the person that's being told you need to dress this way or you need to keep your calendar this way or whatever the things are that we quote unquote need to enforce quote unquote in standards in our organization by simply saying we are going to inspire people, influence them to be an example of, makes it more workable and far, like it's not a moral conversation more, which definitely changes the way superiors in that organization speak to their subordinates. Yeah. By simply coming alongside them rather than, didn't you know that you're supposed to do it this way? Yeah. So when we introduce morality, like good and bad, that's what I mean by that, right? So when we introduce you're a good person, if you do this, you're a bad person, if we don't, what happens is whenever something's not happening, I'm relating to you like you are bad, you're wrong, the situation is wrong, something is wrong, mm -hmm. which again, has both of us be less effective. Because when I'm coming at you like you're wrong, what does that incite from you? When you relate to me like I'm wrong, mm -hmm. then the first thing I'm going to do is defend whatever I've done. Yeah. Defend, rebel. You're going to have to really be like a bigger person to say, oh, yes, thank you for pointing that out. And Right? Versus if I come at you from we want to perform higher and performing higher means we do what we say and what we agree to. And here's a missing link between where we are and performing higher, right? So I'm relating to you like, not like you're bad and wrong or even that you're good and right, but I'm just relating to you as a performer interested in higher performance. Yes. Holding people accountable inherent in that phrase is there's something that went bad. There's something wrong here. And if I can pull out the morality of right, wrong, and instead I come from, it's just more workable. Things work better when we do what we said we would do. That enables me to now follow up without making you wrong or avoiding making you wrong or tiptoeing around the fact that you didn't do something. It's just, hey, Paul, we want to work better together. And I noticed this didn't happen. So what are we going to do about that? Well, and if we go back to like the original clarity or agreements that we originally made with folks, it also seems like if I'm committed to not holding people accountable, <laughs> but reminding them of our agreements and then moving forward better, I got to think it's also going to open up that maybe the first several times one of our listeners does this, they may discover they didn't produce a real proper agreement or enough clarity initially. 
And then that's going to, instead of being in a disagreement with somebody while they defend themselves, they're now going to like discover together that maybe the agreement wasn't done well enough. And that might be one of the things that's going to be in the next iteration of those two working together is both doing a better job to make sure that they produce the promise correctly. You know, and I, I have another client and this client we've been working with for six months. We did a strategic alignment. They didn't get to the action plan. That was the problem. So we had a one year, here's what we want to accomplish in one year. And it was taking so long to get from these guys, just specifically, what are the outcomes? What are the milestones? And what are the specific actions you want to commit to, right? Mm -hmm. So here's what we uncovered. And it was this awful dynamic that my colleague and I were like, holding our client accountable or trying to attempting to and you know this is the thing that they wanted and this is the thing that they hired us to support them with and it was like they weren't it was almost like they were avoiding giving us actions or giving us milestones and it was this weird dynamic it was like i felt like we were just pulling these guys across the finish line and then we were scheduling a time to come back in person and it was like we just couldn't pin them down on so many things, right? We're trying to get a clear agreement. And it was just, I mean, it was amazing. Their mastery, I'm putting in quotes, mastery of keeping things vague and <laughs> ambiguous. And and it wasn't until we got together again that I realized, oh my gosh, you guys have developed this habit of keeping everything so vague and so ambiguous. And so it's impossible to come back with any kind of accountability. And they laugh, they go, oh yeah, yeah, we totally do that. You know, I don't want you to hold me accountable. So we're going to keep things vague and ambiguous. And it was all fun and games until they realized that that habit was sacrificing the future that they so were compelled by, that they so badly wanted to create And this little, let me prevent you from holding me accountable. I never want to be held accountable. That proactive defense of keeping things vague and ambiguous and hard to pin down was sacrificing the very future that they had hired us to support them in accomplishing. Well, and just for our listeners, Carrie, what does that sound like? I mean, you kind of mentioned ambiguous, but without something specific, would it be like something as simple as, you're bringing up something to someone and they say, oh yeah, I'll start working on that next Monday, which is like, you're making a commitment to when you're going to do some stuff, but not to when I'm going to get the end result of that stuff. Is it like that or is it something different? It sounds like that. Oh yeah. I mean, I think we all do it. You know, I it, it's really avoiding the domination of responsibility, like being responsible mm. for something. So You know, it could even look like, hey, how about we come back? Why don't we get together November 6th and 7th? That sounds good. Yeah, that will probably work. Yes. Let's have lunch sometime (laughs) to discuss that project. Yeah. Or, yes, we want to create a highly trained workforce. Great. Now, what actions or what milestones you know, would support us on the way or what, you know, what, what would it look like to have a highly trained workforce by, I don't know, December, 2020. And they might say some specifics there. Okay. Well then, you know, where do we need to get to by December, 2019 to begin to put us on the path for highly trained workforce in 2020. And then I just wouldn't get anything back, like nothing back. Mm. You know, so it was, well, yeah, we'd have to start training, but training in what? Or why don't you, you know, fill out the action plan and and send it around? Okay, that's great. And by when can you have that? Well, you know, I have a lot of meetings, you know, just like kind of vague. Even if we pin them down to the end of the month, it's, it's just always keeping the back door open. And it's this funny thing that happens because when we don't stand and be clear about our own agreements and and commit to things and put ourselves out there, then it almost invites other people trying to pin us down and holding us accountable. And that's what happened in this client system. It was like all of a sudden my colleague and I were doing things that we don't preach, (laughs) you know, 
<laughs> and, and I was like, how do we get into this dynamic? We don't have a partner on the other end equally committed to their success. It's like we're more committed to their success than they are. So if somebody's listening right now and they're inside of an organization that's that way, and maybe they're not in the greatest, like maybe they're not the most superior person in their configuration so that they can't dictate, we're just going to change this. What would be your suggestion for them to really begin to get clarity around agreements and commitments rather than things being left so wide open that you couldn't tell if somebody did what they committed to or not? Well, I think, you know, the name of this episode is to stop holding people accountable, Mm -hmm. right? And the first thing that my colleague and I had to do was to realize we were chasing them down. We were trying to chase people down. We were micromanaging our client, Mm -hmm. right? So we had gotten into this, the very default model of accountability that our work is designed to break us out of. So I think that's the first thing is to see where you're more committed to the outcome than the person that, than the actor, right? The person who's supposed to be doing the actions. And we had to bring it up as a tough conversation, but we did bring it up when we were with this client. We said, you know, sometimes it feels like we're more committed to this outcome than you are. And we have to remind you that this is your outcome. You know, this is your outcome. This is what you want. And so, you know, I feel like in every episode, we kind of return to this idea, Mm -hmm. which is to stop, get reacquainted with, for the sake of what are we even having this conversation? What's the shared future? What's the shared outcome that we both equally care about? And if you don't have one of those, then that's where to start. You know, sometimes you're so far down in this in this model, default model, that you are in an organization where people are literally coming to punch the clock and do the actions and leave. Mm-hmm. You know, I haven't met a lot of people, and I know that there are a percentage, but I haven't met a lot of people that, given the opportunity, don't want to enhance their identity, who they are in the world, what they're contributing to, what they're up to. And as a leader, sometimes, even as a peer leader, our job is to create that meaning and give people an opportunity to make a noteworthy contribution to some outcome. So, you know, expanding our creativity and our imagination in our dialogue with another person to say, well, why do you care about this? Mm. Why is this important to you? And just beginning with that outcome in mind shifts us back into partnership. And then asking in our previous conversations, you saw that taking this action was an obvious next step for us in achieving this shared outcome. Do you still see that? So it's almost like I know we keep returning, but when I'm holding people accountable, when I'm chasing people down, the first thing I'm asking myself is have they lost sight of what we're trying to accomplish together and why it matters to them and why it's meaningful? You know, have they lost sight of that? Or is there something else that they just don't know how to do it? Did they not do something and now they're hiding out because they have injected a good dose of morality and now they think they're a bad person and they're avoiding contacting with me? Yes. There's a lot of reasons that might put me into this dynamic, but those are some of the places that I look first. Was that helpful or can you make that even more practical? Even more practical would be like, what would, if somebody's just been ambiguous every time you're asking for a commitment, what would you say? And maybe it's, it's going to be slightly different for every situation, but what is language that you might give somebody that would go something like, this would be the way not to do what I imagine is, listen, every time I ask you for something, you give me an answer that I could literally write down here, look at a week later, and I wouldn't know if you did it or not. I don't want you to talk to me that way. I want you to give me what you're going to do and by when. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So that is an example of what not to do (laughs) for our audience. What would be the way Mm. to communicate that that's more in partnering with them 
about the future. Cause I, and I love, I think what you gave was a lot of ways to be, mm -hmm. but to press in of like, what were, what are the words? So if we've got that being of, we want to realize that they want this for the future, we're doing it for them also, but what are the words that would come out of my mouth when that's my intention to come alongside somebody and build partnership in that? Yeah. You know, if it consistently goes that way, it could look like, Hey, Paul, um, <laughs> I notice whenever we're making agreements for the future, it feels like there's an element of kind of vagueness or ambiguity. I'm personally kind of uncomfortable moving forward with that vagueness and ambiguity. Could we get more specific so that I know that we're both on the same page, like I'm on the same page as you are about our expectations, that we have aligned expectations? That is wonderful. That is exactly what I was looking for is that, hey, I feel a little bit uncomfortable. I want to be able to support and help all of us and be able to get this accomplished. But I don't know that we'll be able to be on the same page and understanding. I, I love that, Carrie. I think that gives our audience something they can literally do the next time somebody says they're going to start working on it next week, or they'll try to get it done by next Friday, or they don't get an email answer back, <laughs> as you were talking about. I think that is phenomenal and to put them in a position that we would all understand that what we don't want to be doing is having that conversation from coming from the place of holding them accountable that we stop holding people accountable mm -hmm. and remind people of the partnership that they're in with their agreements with us yeah and i might even just to keep it short stop holding people accountable and create the condition of accountability mm, stop holding people accountable and create the condition of accountability or yes. stop holding people accountable and inspire accountability. Ooh, I like that very much. I think that's a great place to end it. Having brought full circle from stop holding people accountable <laughs> and instead create the culture that allows for accountability and inspires accountability. Once again, Carrie, thank you so much. And to our audience, just take this week to take the time to put yourself in the position that you're going to be able to inspire that within your organization, that you're going to be able to remind people of their partnership with you and their agreements so that what you get the chance to do is demonstrate what it is to have a culture that does what they say they're going to do and handles their agreements. And just like our last episode, giving them the chance to really be responsible for their own commitments. And we hope that this conversation today has been a contribution to your leadership impact. Thank you for tuning into Leadership Impact, the podcast for modern executives who are reinventing leadership within their organizations. Subscribe now at Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. And to support you in your leadership impact, we've offered a special course rate to you, our listeners. Just text the word accountability to 555-888 and you'll receive the link. Learn more at grangernetwork.com and join us next week on how to transform your leadership impact with accountability.